The number one mistake made by Photoshop newbies is thinking that digital art is all about learning the software and it's totally not. Clinton Lofthouse is a special effects photographer and has a truly unique perspective when it comes to photo manipulation. In this video he's going to show you how to use the science of fine art and photography to make your work look much more realistic and believable. Stay with us to the end on this one guys as Clinton drops 13 hacks, tricks and tips positively guaranteed to take your work to the next level. <laughs> So what I'm doing here is going into my stock library and going through the figures that I've already downloaded from Adobe Stock and then I have to cut out by someone else. Uh, it just saves time uh, and time is money. So I mean, I use premium stocks just because they're a lot higher quality. There's a lot more choice as well if you go into uh, sites like Adobe Stock. If you've gone DeviantArt, you can be searching for hours just trying to find something of high quality. So what I usually do is I, I know the concept and then I'll download a lot of kind of images what will fit into that concept and then I play around trying to choose which ones look best. I did start off with that warrior guy and I thought this, it just doesn't seem to fit with the other woman so then I changed it to the okay. other Okay and where are these stocks from? So I see a watermark there. Are all of these stocks from Adobe Stock? Yeah pretty much. I think every single one's from Adobe Stock which uh, sometimes I might get some PNGs from um, DeviantArt, but yeah, it's mainly uh, Adobe stock that I use. And when you so started you... out, was you using mainly free stocks? So at what stage of your career did you get into using premium stocks? Um, quite a lot later, just because of the costing of premium stocks. It can be, if you're not actually doing it as a living, it, it can be cost quite a lot if you're not making any money. Even from it. if you are um, doing it for, for a living, it can cost quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah. I remember before I had to ration. I had to ration my um, my stock credits, and I had to make ten Adobe downloads stretch yeah. across an entire month. And yeah, I know that. I know. One. I know. I know that feeling. I I started kind of striking up partnerships with people who had stock. Uh, sites. There was a one that I can't remember what it's called. It might be Canstock now. So I got a, yeah. a a little deal with them where they would give oh, me some handy. free downloads. Yeah, for to just for the and they could use the images how they wanted. The concepts fantasy. So you want to make sure you have epic landscapes. So I went through Adobe Stock and found the best landscapes for that. And then you need to make sure when you pick the background stock that when you're blending it together, the light direction needs to be coming from the same size it's the same color temperature or you have to manipulate that later on down the line yep can you, you just, just elaborate on color temperature for me please mate so color temperature is when you do photography your camera has different color temperatures so when you come into a room to take a photo it will be a different color temperature to when you shoot outside yep so like when you shoot indoors it can be sometimes like a yellowy tungsten color when you're outdoors it can be more of a blue color so when you're bringing these, all these images together, shot in different locations into Photoshop, what you will want to do is match the color temperature of each image. And what's the um, benefits of doing that? Of matching the colors? Yep. Uh, it, well, the images, images will blend together. Um, okay, so a greater sense of realism? Yeah, and just, well, yeah, basically when you create a composite, everything, all the colors need to match like they would be in that scene together. Because what you're doing is you're creating an image what in real life doesn't exist. You're taking elements from different photographs and putting them all together. So if you had a different color temperature mountain to a different color temperature uh, ground, the eye would pick up on that straight away and you would know that as a composite, okay. it's not really done its job. And what methods are you using to blend these landscape elements together? So what I use is layer masks. And anyone who uh, uses Photoshop will know that layer masks and layers is kind of your foundation. If you don't know how to yep. use layers, then you're not really going to be able to co composite very well. Um, so when I started learning Photoshop, the first thing I learned was layers. And I learned it from a book. Obviously, show my age now because no one reads books anymore. Yeah, but, I, I think uh, I learned it from a book as well, to be a honest. Book called, I think it was a book actually called... Photoshop just called Secrets? No, I think it was just called Layers. Oh, okay. Uh, it Fair was enough. by the same yeah. guy. Who, it was by the same guy who wrote Photoshop Secrets, by the way. Yeah, I um, remember those books. Everyone had them, especially if yeah, you was doing yeah. a college or uni. Though it was on the recommended reading list. Yeah, yeah. So we should write a book one day. Uh, I've been thinking about it. I just it's finding yeah. time, isn't it? Collab it. Um, Collab it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 
So yeah, so when you bring these things into layers, what you do is you put them on top of each other and then you want yep. to use your layer masks to blend in and out um, and then blend these two photographs together. And obviously if your light source is the same, your color temperature is the same, it's going to blend together a lot better than if you've got contrasting light and contrasting colors. Okay, yeah. and give us a quick breakdown on how exactly a layer mask works. So a layer mask is basically non-destructive. You can ba basically reveal or hide certain information. Yep. So when you bring it onto the screen, you put your layer mask on and it'll be white. If you switch that to black, what black does is it hides that layer and shows you the yep. layer underneath. So what you have to do then is you need to paint in certain areas of that image. So it's um, white to reveal, uh, black to conceal. Oh, wow. So I like that. Let me write that one down. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I always say visible or invisible. And yeah. the way I talk, I struggle with these. And um, it Ooh. ends up sounding like invisible. <laughs> <laughs> so so say your little saying again, because I'm writing so that down. It's white to reveal, black to conceal. White to... <laughs> <laughs> white to reveal. Black to conceal. All right, so yeah, tell us what's going on now with this layer stack. What 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 stage are we at in this so we've, kind of we've, composite? I've composited the background together now, and I've added in the foreground elements, um, which is these rocks, and they've got the models as well. So what, yep. once you've added all your composited elements in, then what you need to do is start blending and adding atmosphere effects. So the more little bits of realism you can add to a composite, the more you'll be able to sell it. Yeah, when so you, you say see, atmosphere effects, what does that mean? So if you can look in the background between the, the rocks what are in the foreground and the mountains yep. in the background, I've added atmosphere, like I've added mist. Um, that's just to create depth, but also realism. When you go to the top of a mountain, you do get these atmospheric like mists or haze as you walk So up. it's like the illusion of depth of field. Yeah, basically. The, the way I look at when you create a composite is how would that look if, it, if, if you took this image with a camera how would it what, look? How would it look? And that's so what a lot look... of photo manipulation mm. is, really, isn't it? Is is the illusion of realism? Yeah, yeah. So that's why you get people putting lens flares and lens distortions because the way we see media nowadays is usually through a lens. So yep. we're used to seeing these images like th through a lens. So if you don't see all these imperfections, the, the brain picks up on these and thinks this seems too perfect to be a real scene. So you need to add these little imperfections in. And what other things would you do to unify those characters to make them look like they were shot in the same location on the same day? So you've explained uh, the colour. Mm. Uh, what else would you do? I would uh, play with the tonal uh, values as well. So that's light and dark. I would make sure that they, when you create an image, there's kind of a hierarchy of light to dark and the images in your character images probably want to be lighter than um, some of the other elements in the image because that's where it, it draws your eye to them. So the best way to for me to kind of look at visual hierarchies, I'll change the image to black and white and it completely gets rid of colour. And then you, you're just looking at the image tones of and lights then, and darks. So what in particular are you looking for? What is it that you want to see? Like, Because this that, isn't that, something that I do, so I'm interested as well. Usually the focus of the image that wants to be kind of the area of greatest contrast. So you these figures here, I yep. want them to have the greatest contrast in the image compared because to... Because they're others. the main focal point of the yeah. image. So wherever the main contrast is, that's where your eyes will go. And it's yep. the same as wherever the, the highest saturated area of the image is, the, your eyes will go there as well. So what you're trying to do when you create a composite is you're not trying... You're trying to create a pleasing image, but you're also trying to guide someone's eye through the image by using these little techniques. And, and your uh, angle is more photorealism as opposed to stylized, like what um, Christian does. You you favour a more photorealistic approach. It depends on the on the image, but most of the time I do prefer to to go for a little bit of real. I can't. Well, actually, I'm. I guess it's a bit of a mixture. I kind of want fantasy, but I also want realism at the same yeah. time. So, um, I, if it's just completely fantasy i think some for me it just tends to lose some of the realism and it tends yeah. people just look at it and think ah it's a little too fake sometimes but i mean yeah it's I an acquired it, taste for yeah, yeah definitely it depends on your on because obviously art subjective so it depends it on your tastes as well 
Um, but I grew up on watching a lot of cinema, a lot of fantasy movies. So and that's my... what you were looking for, that cinematic yeah, finish. Yeah. As if it's a still from a movie. Yeah, that's kind of what, what I usually go for. Can mm. you explain a little bit about the uh, dodge and burn process that you're doing here and why you do it? Yeah, so dodge and burn, if everyone's anyone's seen my work before, I, I tend to use this in most images. Uh, and you can be, use it in many different ways. So what I'm doing at the minute is I'm just creating a little bit more depth in the form of the models, but then I'll also be using it to pull out some details of the of the hair. What so what do you mean that. by depth? What what does that exactly mean? So I'm darkening the darks and um it's basically basically creating contest but contrast, sorry, but you can also okay. form you can make someone look better looking with dodge and burn. Um, okay. Just by by darkening and a bit like the it. shaping that they do, the contouring with makeup yeah, is, is on that's, a that's similar exactly vibe. Where, yeah, that's exactly where I learned how to do the face dodge and burn by looking at makeup guides online of how they do the contour. Okay. And, and yeah, what that's it does cool. it just it just brings out people's facial features more and it just adds a little bit of depth. And some depending how strong you do the dodge and burn, you can actually make people look like they've been painted or the the Yeah, to um, I've watched your dodge and burn mm. video many times um to learn it myself because I was a complete newbie with dodge and burn. Um and guys, the link for Clinton's dodge and burn video is down below in the description and you're using the same dodge and burn for both figures yeah it depends if it, if i've got if it's a big image and it's got loads of different characters what i may have to still move around I, i'll dodge and burn a group for each character but when i feel like i've got the composition set already and i'm not going to move the characters anymore then i'll just do the characters together but yeah i used to use a soft light and 50% grey dodge and burn, but I believe like the curves dodge and burn is better just because it's non-destructive. And, and you all... have both those layer modes to luminosity. Yeah, yeah, just so it doesn't affect the, the colours too much when you're dodging and burning. And is that what the luminosity layer mode does? Yeah, because if you don't put it on luminosity, what happens is when, you dodge, when you're when burning, it'll, you'll notice like it's going red as well in certain areas and you get these colour shifts. So it will so, create like aberrations and yeah, excess yeah. saturation. Yeah, oh, so when you put it on luminosity, you get less of those colour changes in the, in the skin tone. Yeah. And is, do you dodge and burn all of the work that you do? I actually dodge and burn less than I used to. Um, but yeah, I always dodge and... I kind of mainly dodge and burn the, the focal the focal points of the images nowadays. I know when I first started doing Photoshop, I would dodge and burn literally everything in the image, uh, which did actually lead to more, I guess, cartoonish looking images. Uh, now no, you but... you did um, a Gaussian blur on some of the grass that was on that mountain ridge. Why did you do that? Again, blending in the elements into the scene. So, because. Well, and this depends if you're trying to mimic like what uh, you would see in a photograph obviously it also depends if you if the photograph you would be mimicking had a shallow depth of field so in this one again i think um i tend to blur the background a little bit and then i'll blur the elements coming forward a little bit gradually less and less until you get to the models yep. and again that creates depth of field so it looks like you would see in a, in a maybe a movie or in a photograph but what it also does is it helps your focal point or your model stand out against the background. Excellent. If everything's really sharp, your eye doesn't know where to look in the image. Yeah, yeah, and and like you said before about the realism, is that you want mm. to mimic the the focal length of the camera that would theoretically yeah. be there. You're doing a lot of stuff with brushes. Can you explain? How and why you're doing all this brush stuff? Yeah, so for me, cutting out hair is still a, is still a pain in Photoshop. It's never seemed right. to get get any easier. I mean, if you've got like high contrast dark hair against a white background, it's completely fine. Yeah. But when it comes to like yeah, like blondy blondy brown hair against a grey background, you're gonna have to paint in your own hair, and that's basically what I'm doing here because the refine edge couldn't extract the the hair strands out. I'm painting them in with a a brush, a hair um, brush. Is this a specialised brush that you had to download from somewhere? Or is it built I, into the default Photoshop? I actually downloaded it from. I cannot remember, but it's a great brush. It's the best hair brush that I've used, um, especially for little animal hairs. Or after the video, mm. would you be able to get the name of that and where you got it from, and then I can put it in the description for the guys. 
yeah, yeah. I'll try and find it. Um, okay, guys. If you do want the brush that uh, Clinton's using for the fur, if we do find it, we'll put it down into the description below so you can grab it for yourself. And I'll grab it as well because it looks very handy. Yeah, it's super easy to use. Well, a lot of hairbrushes don't seem to work that well. This one's worked perfectly. Um, and then I've also painted some more hair strands in, onto the women at the back just to make it so, so there's more uh, action of the hair kind of flowing in the wind as well. As so opposed again, to just using the original pixel data from the original photo where a lot of the smaller strands would have been knocked out by the compositing yeah. process. Yeah, and again, you don't want everything, nothing to look too perfect. Like I think adding stray hairs in actually adds to the realism of a composite. A lot of people try and make their hair too per perfect. Yep. And again, for me, I, I prefer a little bit of imperfection to, to add to the realism. Yeah. What's now, going on now? So now I'm looking for more stock images. I wanted to add a few some some eagles to the to the image. So again, these are from Adobe Stock, uh, and instead of using the pen tool, which I am incredibly bored of using nowadays, I on this one used Color Select and just took out the okay. white, yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Blend, blended the bird's head back in. <laughs> because it's not uh, like you said earlier, it's not a foreground element. Like you're going to blur it a little mm. bit anyway, aren't you? It, yeah, it doesn't have to be. Mm. and lower the contrast as well so you can barely see it if it's something what's in focus and up close then you need to take a lot more time if it's something what's in the distance you don't need to spend hours cutting things out just use the quickest way possible why so would again, you remove why would you lower the contrast of that bird uh because again blending it into the atmosphere things what are further away in the distance there tends to be more atmospheric disturbances like aerial perspective and usually that means there's less contrast and there's a more blue tone to the areas further away. Now, can so again, you explain that, the blue tone? What do you mean by that? Have you ever stood on a mountain and looked in the distance and then you, you can see the, the different mountains and the further yeah. back they go, the less contrast they are to the eye. And then there's always like a, a kind of a atmospheric haze, which is, tends, to, tends to be blue-ish. Okay. Yeah, um, that makes sense. But it's called aerial perspective in technical terms. Cool. So um, theoretically, this eagle would be sharper without the kind of lowered contrast. And yeah. it, because it's a foreground element, it's in focus, yeah. it's with our but, main figures. Mm, but what I did actually do is I did blur it a tiny bit because it was too sharp. So okay. put because it's gonna be it was standing on the shoulder of the woman. Uh, because this is actually, I think it's a, a, a CG eagle. CG right. elements tend to be a lot sharper than the photographs. So when you put it on the woman's shoulder, you can tell it, it looked too sharp. So what I did is I just added a little bit of a blur to it again to match the quality of the sharpness of the model. Did you do well. that directly to the pixels or do you use a smart filter for that? Um, it depends really. I, I, most of the time I will use a smart filter just because it's um, you can go back in and play around with the settings yeah. if it's not right um back in the day old days of photoshop if you put a blur on it, it usually had to be something that was final and if not if it didn't work out you would have to go back down through the layers and delete it and try and yeah. work out what to do <laughs> thank god those days are over mm. right so we got our eagle mm. and that that's a part of the main focal yeah the the main focal element and then you copied and pasted the claw over the top to create yep. the illusion that you know part of the body is behind the figure and then yep. you separated those elements to have it over the shoulder of the figure which yep. is more advanced compositing techniques yeah and i guess this is i would say this is part of the storytelling element like i didn't have to put a bird on a shoulder yeah but it kind of adds to the character and it adds to the story but I mean, obviously thinking in fantasy game terms, like she could control this bird or maybe there's some sort of connection and it, it kind of when they're going to battle, the bird helps fight for for the lady. So just thinking about little kind of random story elements as well sometimes can help add depth to an image story wise or narrative wise. I can see you're using adjustment layers there quite often. Can you explain why? You use adjustment layers and the yeah so what i'm it. using using there the ones what you, you saw then going off and on with the different colors is actually the check layers or the help okay. layers so what i'm doing is checking that all the hues are matching and that the saturations are matching and then the tonal values are matching 
so basically it's a group of layers so one black and white one needs to ch check the tone as we mentioned earlier right now i'm checking the saturation to make sure all the saturations yep. either match or something in the background is not too saturated and then the next one after that is hue and that's to make sure all the, the separate elements of the image all the hues are, are similar so they all blend together and right now at this moment is the kind of final color grading again if you've watched any of my videos it tends to be gradient map mixed with selective color to put some color into and the you shadows you normally put a dash of red into those blacks to give it that yeah a little bit of red or sometimes i used to i mean that's the one i do nowadays i used to use like a brown color grade a gradient map and then i'd add some blue into the shadows and that also okay. creates a nice color grade but it depends on the image I, I tend to prefer red in the shadows now just because it feels a little bit more painterly okay yep you explained that on another video it's yeah good explanation what's going on so what, here so what, what i'm doing now is I'm, I'm darkening those two foreground rocks Again, because we're trying to match the light uh, and the light source is kind of natural, but coming from behind. So these, the rocks at the front of the, uh, on the front side would be darker. Yep. So I'm just darkening those front sides down. Again, just kind of thinking about the realism of the scene and, and painting in tonal values to make it match with the rest of the scene. So getting get to this part of the image now, it's mainly finishing touches. And make and sure, making sure do you refer to that together. as post-processing or global um, processing? I don't tend to globally process until it... I mean, even with the sharpening, I tend to... I'll put it on globally, then I'll selectively paint it in. Okay. So I'll, I'll hide it with a layer mask, and then I'll paint in the, the adjustment that I want. So, for example, when I do sharpening, what I'll do is I'll hide the sharpening high-pass uh, layer with an inverted mask. And then I'll go in and I'll paint the sharpening onto the areas that I want to look sharp. What's the uh, benefits you, of doing that? Why do that? Well, if you sharpen everything, it can look, it doesn't look great, especially on skin. If you sharpen yeah. people's skin, it brings out loads of flaws and imperfections. So what I tend to do is I'll paint in the sharpening over the eyes and around the lips. And, and how would you do that? In the hair. I'll do it pet just with a layer mask. With a layer mask. Yeah. And then I'm just going, what I do now is once I've got the whole image together, I'll go in and scout around really zoomed in on the image to see if i've missed any areas or if any masks need cleaning up yep uh, this is usually the last part and the part that's least fun that's why it gets left to last um just going yeah. in and tidying all the layers up but it's something that needs to be done or you could be like me and just pencil everything and know it's <laughs> perfect right out the gate no one wants to torture themselves that much apart Unless, from you yeah i suppose yeah right so <laughs> we've got the composite we've got the background We've got some kind of, I call it global processing, where you're doing kind of color edits to the whole mm. piece as opposed to individual elements. What have we got going on now? Ooh. So now I'm playing around with the uh, Neo Stock Light Effects bundle. Okay, so you've got the Ultimate Light Effects bundle. Yeah, and then I'm trying to remember what I did with this. I think I just can't, sometimes I'll blend some effects into the background quite uh, subtly. So you might not okay. really see them that much with the eye, but there'll be there'll be a little light leak here and there, which again, when someone in the real life is stood kind of in a certain situation, if the light hits them in a certain way, they get the, the, there'll be like a leak of light on their arm or maybe okay. yep. on the clothing. It's like an overspill, isn't it? A light leak yeah. overspill, where it doesn't yeah. go in a, a kind of clean manner. It, it, it spills over the object. And that, that's yeah. one of the main things I learned from your tutorials way before this channel project that we're doing together now. Yeah, I guess speaking about this today, a lot of my work is about adding imperfections and not getting rid of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess this is kind of again just going through the final stages. I, I tend to look at the image and think, right, what needs to be changed? Obviously, I noticed that the, the eagle's feet looked a bit too uh, bright, so I've just darkened the feet down as well with a curves adjustment. And I started in a little bit of a shadow on, and then I, I take the opacity down of that, obviously, because it's natural light and it's pretty much coming from above as well. So it'd be a very uh, slight shadow. You can look at the models. Uh, shadows and stuff as well sometimes to get a yeah i do that a lot a guide on the existing yeah yeah and did you did you blur those at all did you leave them sharp the feet yeah the, the, the whole shadow, bird's the thing shadow the, the, the shadow that you created oh, oh yeah i would have blurred it a tiny bit and then i just put the pulled the opacity right down as yep. well so you can just about see it if you zoom in 
Um, and then obviously I blurred the birds a little bit as well, just because it was too sharp. Well, that was Wicked Clinton. Thank you for sharing your insights and techniques with the guys watching today. No problem. It's always a joy. Okay, that will do it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed. I'll catch you in the next video. See you then.